I think we need to move on to what is really the pressing matter of this week. And this is a lull period in sports, but boy, I think you could agree we got one hell of a story this week coming out of golf of all places. Yeah, absolutely. I think that caught literally every single person off guard, right? Because even the PGA players had that they found out the same way that the rest of us did was right through the through the news cycle. It was amazing. I was sitting actually right here during my day job and my phone lit up and it said the following the PGA and the DP World Tour and the Live Tour have all merged essentially. And there's so many layers to this, but I think the connection here to this and the next story we're going to talk about is the Saudi government. Now, I would say probably for the last few years, I can't remember exactly what year that reporter was killed by the Saudi government or quote unquote allegedly, as people would like to say. But the Saudis have been sort of, they've had a bullseye on them in terms of, I think, societal morality and all of the world talk about many different things related to how they run their country. One thing their country has a lot of is what people like to call fuck you money. They certainly have a lot of it. And they have started to dabble and invest in other parts of the world. And sports has been a place that they've really been focusing on. And this live tour came out of the PGA having a lot of players and a lot of prominent players talking about the fact that really they had a monopoly and that players weren't getting paid enough for what they were putting out for the PGA. And the PGA, I believe, runs as a legal nonprofit organization. And at this point, they are merging with so much money that the future is interesting. But what has gotten us to this point is a lot of things. And I think that the media coverage of this, specifically the PGA being so outspoken about the morality issues that the Live Tour was providing, has made all of this so interesting. But I want to get just sort of your initial thoughts on this when you heard it, because it took me by surprise. But there's so many layers to it that we haven't even gotten close to scratching the surface on it. But just your initial thoughts when you heard the news. Well, first of all, I felt bad for those players in the PGA that were very loyal and outspoken in favor of the PGA and and standing by them throughout all this. I really think they probably believed that they were just going to have to weather the storm and that the PGA would ultimately prevail. Now, granted, this were what are we a year we're just a year into it, right? It was, yeah. I think. So obviously the PGA saw, saw the writing on the wall and felt there wasn't a path to do that. Um, so I did feel bad for like the Rory McIlroys of the world. And you can take Tiger Woods out of the equation. That guy is going get to his, get his bag either way. But like the Rory's of the world and people like that who turned the money down to stay in the PGA for a lot of moral reasons uh, for the most part. And, and yeah, there's tons of human rights issues we can talk about when it comes to the Saudi government. Uh, one that sticks out, uh, in my mind, which, of course, I can't recall if this was, uh, you know what, I know for a fact I'm wrong, so I'm just going to move on. <laughs> uh, anyways, plenty of human rights issues within the Saudi government that we can point a finger at. The problem I have with people as a whole having this big uprising about this specific issue in regards to Saudi government is those very people who are fired up about this. They're probably purchasing products that are produced by, owned by, or made by people in some you know one of these human rights violating countries in the Middle East or China or somewhere like that you know and on a daily basis you know one of their favorite things could be produced by produced in a country that is is made by sla- child slave labor that doesn't have women's rights or any of those things but this is this is the the hill they're going to die on is this specific situation and I think that's kind of silly and I think that's something that as a whole as a country that we do and we're very hypocritical in that way as we we pick and choose the things we want to be offended by or or take you know take the moral high ground on i mean at the end of the day if there's anything we've learned in the world of sports it's that money wins at the end of the day all the time money wins and and there's a story a little ways down the line here um if we get to it that i think is is pertains to that as well i'm not i don't have any like moral beef over the situation I'm not surprised by it. Like I said, at the end of the day, it's all about the cash. I do feel bad about the players that, you know, kind of carried the torch for the PGA and, and feel like they were left out in the cold a little bit. But, it, you know, and, and and to talk about the PGA payment structure a little bit, I think people will be, the people that aren't informed will say, like, what do you mean they don't get paid well? You know, because they're going to look at the Tigers of the world and the Phils and those guys that have, you know, are always winning and making this money. What people don't realize is these guys, for the most part, are on the hook to pay their own way in these tournaments, transportation, entry fees, everything else. And if you don't make the cut, you get nothing. 
absolutely like debt zero. You don't get a thing. Now, sure, you might have a sponsor. You don't pay for your clubs, this and that. But like, you're talking about paying, you know, to travel across the country to play for two days, and all the expenses associated with that. You got to pay a caddy, and if you don't make the cut, you walk away with zero. Now, if you can get yourself up into the top ten or twenty once or twice a year, you're probably covered as far as just living expenses and living comfortably. That's not a given by any means. You know, these top tier players, like they are the exception. Um, you know, you know, think about the, I don't know what we would call them, the, the lunch pail golfer, right? The guy that's that's grinding his way weekend to weekend, just trying to make ends meet and trying to make it. Now, is is life going to improve for that guy under this merger? I don't know. I don't know the details. I hope so. I mean, I think it's a fair argument to poke some holes in the, the pay structure of the PGA. Overall, I don't have any major issues with this because for all the reasons I stated about the morality stuff, because there's plenty of other things we all partake in that could be traced back to to somewhere or someone that is a dirtbag. 100% agree with you on that. And I believe I've been on, on record saying that somewhere in the podcasting slash YouTube space. But what is interesting about this is this all started because Greg Norman, who was a PGA champion at one point, decided to get in bed with the public fund of Saudi Arabia, which I believe has something like $650 billion in it or whatever. It's more money than the PGA will ever see at any point in their lifetime. And Live Golf decided that they were going to pump a lot of money into this. $2 billion they put in over the last, whatever, 12 to 16 months. And one of the things that they did to get a lot of these PGA Tour golfers to defect was guaranteed salaries. And they got some pretty big names. It was a lot of guys, as you talked about, guys that hadn't been making a lot of money on the tour. Going over there, they could make more money. I remember one weekend, the Live Golf Tour did, I think it was a three-day tournament. And that tournament, the purse for the winner, was more than the entire purse of that four-day PGA Tour event on the same weekend. So there was a lot of money to be had there. And I think that the longer that this dispute went, the PGA was going to lose out. I mean, they were in legal battles because they suspended all the players that defected. Remember, they couldn't actually participate in all these tournaments. And then all of a sudden, the Masters comes around. And they're like, you know what? We kind of need some of these big names in here. Brooks Kepka, get on in here. And they all of a sudden were loosening up. I think the signs of this were coming up. We saw the writing on the wall starting to happen more and more as this came to fruition, ultimately. But so many other things were taking place as well. And you talked about Rory. Rory 100% is now the meat shield for the PGA. He was out there and was the most outspoken guy. There were other outspoken people, of course, but he was the most outspoken. They really used Rory McIlroy. The PGA used him. And he didn't find out this was happening until I think the night before. And a lot of people are saying that he's happy that there's peace. And I'm sure in some way he is because he's probably happy that he can get back to playing some damn golf. And how do we know that this didn't affect his play? How do we know this didn't affect a lot of other guys' play? I mean, it didn't affect a lot of the live guys on some of these tournaments because Brooks Kepka just won the PGA and he was getting, I think, a $150 million guaranteed contract from live. So he's set. He knows that he doesn't have to win these big tournaments in order to be set. He is set. And the PGA decided that they had to do this because they couldn't stand toe to toe financially with the Saudi government. And I think the moral conundrum here is now the Saudi government is part of this new conglomerate or whatever it is, right, where you're taking the European tour, the PGA, and now live. And in theory, you're going to get all the best golfers at all of the events, and it's going to benefit the fans for the most part. Obviously, it'll benefit financially the golfers. But now you have the Saudi government or representatives of the PIF, as it's called, on this new council. And golf seems to now have sold its soul for money, right? And now they're set. And it's just so fascinating to me that it's coming from a, a sport that has been seen, I think the word I, I heard used was genteel, right? Golf is that sport that people find <laughs> boring and it's an old person's game. And you know what? They said, screw it. Let's get the blood money. No, that's exactly what they did. I mean, I don't blame them, I guess, right? We've talked about it before, adapt or die. And I think that they felt that their hand was forced and they had to do so. And if I correct me if I'm wrong, you're more of a fan than I am. But it, isn't there isn't the Saudi government involved or has been involved in the purchasing of the WWE? They were going to be. Now, the, the WWE has had a longstanding relationship with the Saudi government. They do one or two events there per year. I know I was a little bit pissed off about that because 
they were taking money to have less of a quality product. Like if in the end the Saudis come in and this golf product is quality, fine, whatever. But I know that a lot of people's hangups were with Phil Mickelson and his comments about 9-11 because don't forget, the Saudis had a big connection to 9-11. And those of us who were alive during that period of time, or at least old enough to remember the significance of that moment, especially if you had people that died during 9-11, this really hits home for a lot of those folks. And I can understand that discomfort 100%. But then I also look at our federal government, and this is not a political statement, it's just a statement of fact, but our our federal government is still doing business and trading with the Saudi government. We haven't put them in their place, and I don't believe that it's on a sports league, especially a golf league, to make some moral statement that is not really going to make a difference. Like, if they don't get in bed with the Saudis, what is it really going to do? Is it really going to hurt the Saudis? Like, I know people want golfers and sports people to make these big, grandiose statements about morals and and this is what I believe. And you can do that, but in the end, what's it going to do? And also, are you the right person for this message? Like, is golf the right person to make this message when they're going to find some other way to sell out? You say it all the time. Do not put sports people on a pedestal. And that includes golfers. Golfers are not immune to this. I mean, look at what happened with Tiger Woods. But I want to know from you, though, is do you think that this is going to make for a more interesting golf product because there is no more separation of all these different leagues? And do you think ultimately the golf will be better and everybody will forget about the moral conundrums? Yeah. One year from now, this will just be uh, water under the bridge or whatever other cliche you want to use. I don't. I think it's great for us as fans. Uh, the tournaments are going to be better because you have all the best players together, as you already said. And, and that's really what's what I think everyone wants. I think that's even what the players really want at the end of the day is, you know, it, they want to feel like if they win a tournament that they beat the best guys. You know, they don't want to be like, well, you won the PGA, but Phil wasn't there and Brooks wasn't there and DJ wasn't there. You know, they, they don't want that shit hanging over their heads. Um Anyone who's ever played anything, right? We're all competitive in some way. And we, when you win, it's nice to win, but it means more when you beat the best. And, and you know the best guys were there. So at the end of the day, this is going to be, I think that's what's best for the sport. I understand that people's feelings are hurt over it. And I'm not saying you're wrong if you have a problem with it. I understand and completely respect all of the, the nuance to this and the reasons you could have a, a, a problem with it. It doesn't surprise me. It's what I felt. I feel like they had to do to to save the PGA in a lot of ways. And I think moving forward, it's just going to be business as usual. And we'll never know the difference when it's all said and done. Yeah, I think a year from now, I just wrote that down, by the way, so we can revisit this new. We have a couple of these now. Two years from now, we're going to be visiting something else. or We're going to be visiting Nikola Jokic and whether he's a failure. And a year from now, we're going to be asking and taking the pulse of whether people remember this. But 